Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Isaiah. Now, thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Sheba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight and honor. And I love you. I give people in return for you, nations in return for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offering from the east and from the west, and I will gather you. I will say to the north, Give them up, 
and to the south do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Whoever is called by my name, whom I create for my glory, whom I formed and made. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Psalm 29, we shall read that verse. Ascribe to the Lord, you gods. Ascribe to the Lord the glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. We worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon, is upon the waters, the God of glory thunders. The Lord is upon mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is a powerful voice. The voice of the Lord is a voice of splendor. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedar trees. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. It makes Lebanon skip like a cat. And Mount Vernon like a cat of us. The voice of the Lord splits the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of heaven. The voice of the Lord makes the oak trees writhe. And strips the forest bare. And in the temple of the Lord, all are crying glory. The Lord sits enthroned above the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. The Lord shall give strength to his people. The Lord shall give his people the blessings of peace. A reading from Acts of the Apostles. And the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God. They sent Peter and John to them. <coughs> the two went down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet the Spirit had not come upon any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Peter, <clears throat> Peter and John laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God.
according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, my Beloved. With you I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let us pray. O God, keep us from mumbling on and on in our prayers when all we ought to say is, Thank you, Lord. Amen. Please be seated. It's always uh, sort of what you do when you visit a place. You take up this valuable time telling about talking about your favorite subject, <laughs> or do you jump right in? We're going to jump right in, perhaps. We'll be together in a few weeks, so I'll reveal myself as we go along. But it is good to be here at the beginning of the year, and it's good to be here on the day of remembrance um, in which we will reaffirm that we will do what Jesus did in a very visceral way by promising and by, <coughs> by uh, acknowledging our belonging to God, our faith in God, and, and then going from there. It's a good time to think about being in this place and being with these readings and being with the imagery of Christ being baptized at the beginning of the year when we probably have maybe we still do that, um, generally have resolutions, right? Who's made resolutions this year? <laughs> Choir, this is going to be awkward with you all behind me. But the story of the church is the choir always backs the priest, right? <laughs> so you're behind me 100%, right? And so we'll say these resolutions, we resolve to keep promises of the baptismal covenant that we do we do the next part of the service, and we will incorporate those, I hope and think, into our daily life and going forward from January 9th into the days ahead. I was a little off put, I confess, when uh, our deacon told me that today we're going to celebrate the baptism of Jesus and not Epiphany. I love Epiphany, as many people probably do, because the outside world comes into the manger scene, and then the explosion happens, and uh, there's a good bit of theology that says, once that happens, Christ is known from the beginning of time to the end of time, sort of this, this revelation is made. But the opposite today is we are here um, getting water and wine fed to, to do the opposite. Instead of coming to see Jesus, we claim and we will proclaim that we know Jesus and then we are to go out into the world doing what we ever do. And so the word, the, the lower word in the gospel passage today that says, um, you know, I think maybe this isn't going to work. Let's just cut, cut this. Um, the 
There's a loaded past word in the passage today that says expectation, right? And resolutions and expectations aren't different, are different, different things. So the people that would go to John resolved to do anything. They went to John in the expectation that something great was going to happen, something big and different was going to be going on in the world than what had happened. They were looking for the Messiah, they were looking for a way out, they were looking for a new way of being. They were as fraught with expectation. And my understanding of this scene has changed over the years, as my understanding of, of John the Baptist has changed. Once upon a time, I was along with everybody where um, that scene where the people come to the, the banks of the Jordan, and John says to them, what did John say to them? The people come to John the Baptist, you hear it in Advent, and he says what? Get behind me. No, he says, <laughs> you ruin <laughs> fighters. <laughs> Right, and we hear that angry tone and that accusing tone and that you brood of vipers. And I was all in on that for years. And we'd like to have those pieces of scripture where we can get a little righteous justice out. We can get a little righteous anger, anger out. We can be a little righteous condensation. But I, I had an epiphany, here's that word, a few years ago that what if we changed John's tone to you brood of vipers? What's a viper? snake. Cold-blooded creature. What's a brood of vipers? Something that's going, looking to try to attack or harm? No, it's a bunch of snakes trying to stay warm. So, so to think of John yelling at these poor creatures who come to him for something different, to, to, for security, for warmth, and for a new way of being, to yell at them and to charge at them, is just out of sorts. So my thinking on John changed a few years ago, and now when I hear John the Baptist, it's not in terms of accusation, it's not in terms of condemnation, it's imitation and tell me your story. Tell me your story. What, who brought you here today? Why are you here today? Why are you passing by that pond? Why are you coming to this table? Because there's expectation rather than resolution. The only time a brood of vipers actually does any harm is when someone's clumsy and steps on the brood of vipers. And they react. As any one of us would. So my whole understanding of John has changed. Just as going from that point, other pieces of the, of the story have changed as well. There's a lovely beautiful essay that was written years ago that the angel, that argued that the angels um, on the hills of Bethlehem were not there to protect the Christ child, because guess what? God doesn't need protection. The angels were on the hillside of Bethlehem singing praises to God because they were no longer were God's army. They had an expectation that their whole way of being was different with this new entity called the Incarnate Word, called Christ. And so, so my understanding of John has changed, and so my understanding of, of the angels on the field of Bethlehem has changed, and so too my whole idea, and under, my idea and understanding, and I'll own this, you can think I'm whatever, after we can uh, talk about those later on, but the whole major scene is, he's not out in a cave. He's not out in a stable. Where is the manger in Middle Eastern homes? Anyone? It's right in the middle of the house. It's right in the middle of the family. The inn part of the story could only be, can also be translated the guest room is full, which means we just come off a season of maybe a relative visiting us. <laughs> The first relative who gets to the house gets the best spare room, right? <laughs> Mary and Joseph, heavy with child, got there late and had to lay him in the manger, right at the center of the house. So what does that do? We no longer have God's uh, prophet castigating and challenging and demeaning and hurting people with his words. We no longer have the angels who 
we uh, in the Old Testament and other apocryphal stories are used as God's soldiers, and we no longer have Jesus out there, but right here in the midst of the center of everything. So I preface those understandings I have because when I read this passage from Luke today, you'll note perhaps too, there's a part missing. It skips over something. And it was interesting that as I was driving down here this morning, I had, uh, I listened to lots of uh, Dr. Who music, but I also listened to lots of American gospel music. And I was thinking, as I was driving along 70, I came 70 to 127, and um, I noticed I passed state. And I, passed, I was getting closer to the Indiana border. And I thought at the time when I was in the seminary and assigned to Christ Church Springfield, that Bishop Christ was there, and he was preaching, and he got up in the pulpit and he said, I have great news. Your seminarian, Charles Wilson, has been traded to uh, for a priest in Alaska, and he's going there upon ordination. And I thought, because last year I served in Urbana for a year, which is west of Columbus, and now I'm out here, which is west of Columbus, so I guess I'm working my way to Alaska. <laughs> but, the point, but the greater point is I'm getting to is, when I Googled map how to get here, all I saw was a compact vision of how to get here. I didn't see relational stuff like Dayton or Indiana or anything else, and so, so to me, I'm just, oh, okay, there's a blue line, this blue line, and then, and then, then blew it out contextually, it's like, oh, here I am and all this stuff. So let's blow this gospel out contextually and read the part that's missing, because I think it's pretty important. I grilled our, our deacon on it earlier, and he uh, failed miserably. Oh, he did not miserably. You, <laughs> you uh, what did they say? You kept the party line. How about that? <laughs> So, so what's missing is, so it says, as the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, and then jumps down to his winnowing fork is in his hand, and then uh, it's skipped over, and then the part that's skipped over is, so with many other exhortations, he, John, proclaimed the good news to the people. But Herod the ruler, who had been rebuked by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the evil things that he had done, added to them all by shutting up John in prison. Okay? That's the part that's left out. So what did we hear today? We heard his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into the granary but a chaff that were burned with unquenchable fire. And then, now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus had also been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and the voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. What does that mean? What could it mean? Talking about changing perspectives and ideas. What, what does that adding that piece in? What does that mean? I know we're all afraid of lightning, right? <laughs> I'm going to say John may not have baptized Jesus because John was in prison. So what does that mean then? Here's an example of what it means. I have two children. My daughter, the older oldest was baptized at Trinity Columbus, our, our parish, my wife's parish church at the time. I was in Hillsborough for two years. And she was baptized at Trinity by Bishop Price. Beautiful, you know, you have to get all the nine yards out with the bishops there. Very glorious, you know, the, the guy baptized Olivia. Three years later, my son's born, time for his baptism. We're back at Trinity, no bishops available, some priest did it. Are the baptisms different? Because one guy, the Marquis, did the baptism of my daughter in a lesser light, if we will, baptized Owen. What does it mean then if we consider, if we consider, I'm not saying it happened, but this is what I thought about, and this is what it clearly says in Luke, 
if we look at the little map piece, that Jesus is baptized by some nobody. I mean, that's what happened in Samaria, where we, in the part, you know, something's going on in Samaria, Peter and John aren't there. When they hear the good news, off they go to, to, to say welcome. To me, what it means is, despite the attempts of the world to shut down or close up God's message and God's purpose and what's going to happen the way God wants it, it's still going to happen. Herod's resolve was he's going to shut this down right away. He's going to take John out. And yet Jesus, according to Luke, was still baptized. God's plan was still enacted. The expectation of Christ's ministry for the world and Christ's life in the world going forward was still going to happen despite whatever the powers that be try to make be. It's worth thinking about. It's worth, it's worth considering. Because we are going to be asked a bunch of questions when I finish this homily. Someone said, are you going to preach a homily? And I was thinking in my head, no, I'm going to preach a sermon, but I don't know the difference between the two. But we're going to be asked these questions to reaffirm our baptismal covenant. And are there going to be another pile of resolutions that we just have, like going to the gym, or whatever, starting January, or calling your mother more, or whatever they are? Or are they going to be a fulfillment of the expectations of the same people who went down to that river Jordan when John was baptizing, with hopes and dreams and plans and desires for another way of being, to set the world right. That's where we are this morning. That's what I think the questions that we're going to be asked are going to be thought of in a way differently than before. Sure, we'll break bread. Sure, we'll repent and turn back to Jesus. Sure, we'll um, proclaim the good news. Sure, we'll do all these things. Sure, we'll look for and um, treat others with respect, whatever the last one is, the late addition. Sure, we'll do all those things. But how will we do those things? Who around us needs to hear those words? Who around us needs to be invited to the table? Who around us need to be treated with more respect. Otherwise, you know, there's so many just gestures or ideas or, if I may say, a sign in the lawn. Luke's story in its completeness this morning tells us there are active instances and institutions in the world that love or resolve because in forcing people to resolve, it's the end, right? This has been resolved. Be it resolved, we decided on this. We're putting that away. But expectation always calls for more, always asks for more, always pulls for more, always leads us to a new place. What are the expectations we have of our, of our children? Simply to be born or to do marvelous things in the world? What are our expectations to, uh, of this is a teaching community, of our students? Simply resolve to get the syllabus done or take that good news that you impart and share it with the world? Herod's still around, as is Christ. We'll always know the Herods by the pomp and circumstance and the and the uh, worldly power they exert, but we don't always know who's going to be the one to baptize a new thing in the world, according to the story today. We don't always know where God's going to pop up out of the crowd. It's only after Jesus has been washed and cleaned and been baptized that it comes out that God makes the big pronouncement. 
he maybe had skirted under the, the radar for a long time. But when we proclaim our baptism, we're turning on the beacon, turning on the light, saying, here we are, here I am. Not just to God and Jesus, but to the world. Right? Otherwise, I don't know. I don't know. Is it just another resolution to get through the year? There's a guy up in um, Augustana University, Richard Swanson, who has written a series of commentaries called Provoking the Gospel. And he has a provoking the Gospel of Luke, provoking the Gospel of Mark, provoke, you know, the four Gospels. And he wrote in his podcast, I guess it was from 2019, that baptism is an act of faith, which is what we're going to do and hear, but it's also, also an act of resistance. And so that question, that statement, has to think, go through our thinking, or should go through our thinking, when I ask those questions of you. When I ask those questions of us, the biggest drawback of, of renewing baptismal vows is being the one who's administering the, is that I always feel a little bit left out. I mean, I respond, but I'm not with you. I'm over there. And it was interesting, I gave, gave our deacon two choices for the renewal of baptism and vows. One is in confirmation, where it says a bishop, and then the one taken from the baptismal service. And he took the one from the baptismal service and said, I thank you. Because I'm just a face in the crowd like you all are. But I've been called, like Jesus, to do great things in the world. And God has a faith in us to do that. Even today, with the Herods out there, and the Jesus out there. We can think about these things anew, because this is what God wants us to do, to shake up the story, understand it differently, so that it means something to us today. And it's not just an add-on to the Christmas year, Christmas season or the new year. Let us pray. O oh God, your word instructs us to be ready to give an answer for the faith that is within us. When that time comes, O oh God, make us bold to proclaim that your love surpasses human knowledge. Let our answer be actions that mirror your love. Amen. Stand now and read to our baptismal vows. Do you reaffirm your renunciation of evil and renew your commitment to Jesus Christ? I do. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God the 
the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Lord. We have continued in the Apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in the prayers. I will, Lord God, will you persevere in resisting evil, and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord. I will, Lord God, will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God and Christ. I will, Lord God, will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself. I will, Lord God, will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being. I will, Lord God, will May Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us a new birth by water and the Holy Spirit, and bestowed upon us the forgiveness of sins, keep us in eternal life by His grace. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. service continues on page 360 of the prayer book with the confession. Let us confess our sins to God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will 
and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you with all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Peace the Lord and be always with you. And also with you. announcements. Um, as you heard, I think in the prayers of the people, Peter Cahuda passed away on Thursday, and uh, Scottish Sisters is with us this morning. Welcome. We're having a funeral service on the next, coming Saturday at 2 o'clock. So I know Peter and the family would uh, be pleased to have as many people in the congregation. He was a really important part of the congregation uh, for a long, long time. So I want to honor his uh, memory in this service here. And it, it's interesting, we were talking yesterday about it, and uh, today we're celebrating baptism, Jesus's and our own, and Peter made the altar that's at the baptism. So if you turn it over on your way out, it will break it. <laughs> now we're replaceable. Uh, you'll see uh, Peter has laid in the back of that. Um, because of the latest diocesan guideline changes, we will not be doing coffee out. So until further notice, if you've signed up for a coffee hour or something, thank you for that, but we're not going to join uh, sharing food and drink until uh, the bishop tells us it's the better thing to do. And especially it's Tuesday, if you have something from the best region, please let Pete know. And that's all I've got. Anybody else? I live in Columbus, and when I'm not uh, visiting churches on Sundays, I serve as a chaplain at Mount Carmel East Hospital and Mount Carmel Grove City Hospital. So um, I've been doing that for about a year. I've been in several parishes throughout the diocese and have not been here. So look at this cross off <laughs> being here. Lovely, beautiful building. Lovely, lovely. Thank you. I look forward to being with you for the next four weeks. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering of sacrifice, praise, and thanksgiving to God.
Therefore, according to his command of the Father, we remember the death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray to you, God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite up to your Son in his sacrifice. 
Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace.
Let us pray the spiritual communion prayer found in our service book. Amen. Amen. 